Ramsey TV. I thought I was going to get to the armor of God today. I really did, but yesterday's show was so intriguing to me. You know, and sometimes it works like this, that after you make a show, I edit it and then I look at it again and I, I get a more clearer picture, get more clarity about certain points, or I see finer points that come up that I didn't see while I was making the video. But the advantage I have in that situation is that tomorrow's another video, so I can tell you about it here and now, and that's just what I'm going to do here on MZTV. This is Martin Zender. Welcome to you. I'm broadcasting from the edge of the bottom of the Floridan Peninsula. I say Floridan uh, Peninsula, of course, to distinguish it from other peninsulas, such as the Indonesian Peninsula, uh, the Korean Peninsula. There's a really interesting peninsula in Japan, the Oshikahanto Peninsula. So I'm not at either one of those. I'm not at the edge of the bottom or at the middle of the top of any one of those peninsulas. This is important to note. So for some reason at, at 5.30 in the morning, I was really able to write. And I wrote the description to yesterday's video at 5.30. And it really came clear to me. So I want to read that introduction to you. You probably already read it. And then I want to apply it specifically to us, members of the body of Christ, and contrast it with unbelievers. I did that yesterday, but there's something new I want to bring up. And then there's an amazing thing I saw for the first time in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I read that passage yesterday, but I did it toward the end of the show, and today I'm looking at it again, and I'm thinking, wow, I see something there that I never saw before. Now you're going to see it too, <laughs> whether you like it or not. All right, so I'm going to my description yesterday of the video titled God's Sting Operation. A sting operation is a setup. You lure people into a certain thing. And God, see, we might, you might be upset at God for doing this, but he's God. He can do whatever he wants. He lures people into in a certain way, in order to expose them to, to themselves. I said that yesterday, but listen to this. I'm quoting myself here. God purposely sets low-hanging fruit, i.e. easily misunderstood scripture passages, in front of those who love traditions and acceptance by their fellow humans above a love for the truth. When the religionists pluck this fruit, that is, when they choose to believe the hearing tickling lies embedded in the mistranslated scripture, they out themselves. There it is. See, they out themselves. It's like God doesn't out them. God could put a spotlight on them now and say, look, these people are in church and they're hearing lies if they studied properly translated scripture. If they watched MCTV, they wouldn't be believing these things and they wouldn't be in this building right now but instead see god could say that to them he could come down and convict them of that but it wouldn't have the same effect as them coming to realize it themselves and this is a judgment when these people come to realize these religionists when they come to realize that they miss it when your friends and your family members come to realize that they missed it it's going to cause a great pang. It's going to cause a great upset and a great regret. But don't worry. That's only phase one. That's only phase one. That's necessary phase. Because that's the only thing that's then going to make the filling of them real. It's almost like, have you ever patched a bike tire? Before you glue the patch on, you have to roughen the surface. You, take a little, you have to make the surface rough so that it'll stick better. So in order for the truth to stick to these people, they need to have everything scruffed up. They need to come to the end of themselves, themselves. You can't give them a whiteboard demonstration and say, well, this is how you are. This is how you should be. You shouldn't go to this church because God does not live in man-made temples. I've done that a million times with people. You've done it a million times. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because God invented human nature 
and God has decreed that they have to find out for themselves. And how do they find out for themselves? God sets up a sting operation. He puts a snare that they walk right into. Like the snare of the cross. That's a passage from scripture. I've talked about that. The snare of the cross. God set up that snare. A snare is a trap. People step into it. Mm, they're trapped. Like with a bamboo shoot. And it lifts them up. See? The snare of the cross is its simplicity. It's completeness. The completeness made by another who is Jesus Christ. And it will be seen that they really don't want that job, salvation, to have been done completely by Christ. They don't want that. But they don't even realize that they don't want that. And you can tell them all day, don't you see you're leaving part of the salvation process up to yourself? In fact, the most important part of the salvation process, you're leaving it up to yourself. Talk to your blue in the face, orange, purple, chartreuse, shades of magenta it's not going to work they have to be caught in that snare that god set up and as they're hanging upside down from it god says you see you see what your brother was trying to tell you you see what your husband was trying to tell you you see what your wife was trying to tell you huh, now i do now i do and now you do because it becomes practical then and now that they've been absolutely demoralized and dethroned from their own little homemade throne, now the proper preparation has been made. The scrubbing has been done. The rubber has been roughened. And now you can apply the patch. And now they'll, now they'll totally accept it, totally get it, and say, oh, thank you. Why does it take that for some people? I don't know. Again, it's God's operation, not mine, not yours. So the title of this show, I think, is God exposes unbelievers to themselves. And I just described that process of God exposing unbelievers to themselves through experience, through setting traps for them that they fall into so that they can freak out. Do you know how you realize how much an animal like panics when it realizes it's trapped? It's horrible. I don't even like to think about it. But that's how these people are going to feel when they realize that God has set them up. I can't think of any other way to say it. And the definition of that is a sting operation. And I gave examples of it yesterday. The common Bible translations with the authority of learned men and women behind it an organization that is lush and lovely and accepting and no persecution so god will expose unbelievers to themselves what about us these same traps that these people get into before the trap is sprung and before they realize their error they persecute the hell out of us and as i said yesterday that gives us something to, to overcome and so god exposes us to the world in a good way he shows us to be suffering for the evangel he shows us to be overcoming these trials and troubles he shows us to be unashamed workmen correctly cutting the word of truth so let me go back to my article here when the religionists pluck this fruit purposely made juicy and uh, luscious looking on the lowest branches you don't need a ladder you don't need a little branch cutter you don't need a cherry picker ah when the religionists pluck this fruit i.e when they choose to believe the hearing tickling lies embedded in the mistranslated scripture they out themselves as lovers of tradition and haters of god they will be made painfully aware of their tainted motives at the great white throne judgment. All their motives were tainted. For now, they are oblivious. They're oblivious, and you can't tell them anything. They have to feel that snare. In the meantime, back to my writing here, those of us understanding the working methods of God, 
He makes it necessary, this is the working methods of God, he makes it necessary to dig a layer beneath the surface in order to find the truth, implanting the motivation himself, of course, in us, which is a hunger for truth. We have a hunger for truth. You're blessed to have this. It is a gift of God. God creates vessels of honor and dishonor, Romans chapter 9. He himself does it. So he gives us this hunger for truth and the same, quote, opportunity, unquote, the same opportunity that damns the tradition bound. It's temporary damnation. Don't worry. The same opportunity that damns the tradition bound grants to the truth seekers a means of distinguishing, of distinguishing themselves, that's all of God, from the whitewashed posers. So again, we can't be distinguished as seekers and as stalwarts of truth, lovers of truth, unless they are the opposite thing. And it is so nice of these people, really. It's so nice of these people to be the opposite of seekers of truth so that you can be seen to be a seeker of truth. Think about it. Without them, you can't be apparent as a seeker of truth. Without them stepping all over these snares, which haven't sprung yet, but they're going to, without them doing that and being obvious to any spiritually attuned person, being obviously wrong, without that, you cannot shine. You cannot oppose it. You cannot rise up against it. And you cannot be apparent to the world as doing the opposite thing, i.e. the noble thing, which is loving and pursuing truth. Thus, purposely mistranslated scripture, purposely mistranslated by God, don't ever forget this. Whenever you get frustrated at why didn't God, God could easily have not mistranslated scripture. He, he's God. He could easily have made it. So the scripture was never mistranslated. The word I own stayed there the whole time. He could have easily said when, when he held up the bread and said, this is my body. It's a metaphor. Uh, he could have easily used the simile which is the same thing, but it's an easier way of, of saying it. He could have said, this bread is kind of like my body. Then nobody would have gotten this crazy idea like the Catholic Church have gotten, has gotten of sub, trans substantiation, whatever the stupid word is, trans, transubstantiation. I hate these theological terms. I refuse to pronounce them correctly. They never would have gotten an idea that this is the body of Christ. They don't realize a metaphor, a metaphor. If, if Jesus had said, this is like the body of Christ, but no. And if you look at Jesus' ministry, he purposely, why does he tell parables? He tells parables so that the masses do not understand him. Setting the snares. And he elucidates the meaning of the parables to his disciples. He says that. I'll put the verse down here. I think it's part of the secrets of the kingdom. Matthew 13, maybe. Anyway. Thus properly, oh, here it is. Here it is. Thus, purposely mistranslated scripture, purposely mistranslated by God, provides a two-edged sword upon which to the one side falls the traditionalists and to the other those seeking after the heart of God. I am contrasting traditionalists with those seeking after the heart of God. In all of this, God has done humanity a favor, exposing itself to itself. The big reveal realized when the hearts of all, both good and evil, become manifest. Because there is a time coming when God will manifest the counsels of the heart. Ours too. We may not be aware of anything that we have done that is... Uh, a tainted response of the heart, but God will reveal that. I want him to reveal it. For these people, whoa, they're going to be like the tin man who doesn't have a heart. And they go to the Wizard of Oz, i.e. God, and gives them a ticker finally, and they come to a realization of the truth. Everything will become manifest in that hour. My final line here this does not prevent god of course from becoming all in all 
1 Corinthians 15, 26, at the consummation of the eons. So I hope that was helpful. I was happy about it when I wrote it and I read it and I said, I got to share this. I got share to share this with the body of Christ. So now I want to bring out a new little tidbit here from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, let's go to verse 10, speaking of false miracles and every seduction of injustice among those who are perishing. Who, who is perishing? What we're going to see, it's those who do not believe the truth. They are perishing. That is, even now, they are not having Aeonian life. They are on a course right now. Those who do not believe Paul's evangel, don't believe the salvation of all, they don't believe Paul has a distinct evangel, they believe the Trinity, they believe in free will, they are perishing because they're believing every lie of Satan that comes down the pike. Free will, eternal torment, the Trinity, you know the drill. Every lie. And that Paul does not have a separate message. Uh, that's a terrible lie because they produce a bastardized gospel, that is a non-gospel, when they mix Peter's gospel and with Paul's gospel. You can read all about that in Galatians chapter 1. I've covered that exhaustively. So that's what perishing is. They're perishing. It's ongoing. It's the indefinite verb form. I'm sorry, it's the incomplete verb form. It could stop. They could stop perishing the minute they get the truth. The minute they come to a realization of the truth. But for now, they're perishing. Why? Simple answer. Because they do not receive the love of the truth. See, it's that word receive that just jumped out at me today. Just a couple hours ago. What does Paul say? Second uh, Corinthians 4, 7, something like that. Eh. Read the whole Bible, you'll find it. Uh, what do you have that you did not receive? So the reason these people aren't lovers of the truth, we know, this is absolute truth, is that they did not They did not receive it. It doesn't mean that it came to them and they refused it necessarily. I think it means that they didn't receive it from God. They didn't get the letter in the mail. They didn't get the phone call. They didn't get the telegram. They didn't get the Western Union of God, what God did to us, right? He invaded our hearts and gave us the truth. They didn't receive that for their salvation. They do not receive the love of the truth for their salvation. I suppose it could be that they were stubborn, that, it, that the information came to them, as in you or me heralding to our friends, our family. It could be that, that they got it, they heard it, but they didn't receive it. But even so, even so, I stand with what I said. The reason they didn't receive it is because God did not cause them to receive it at this time. Even so, it doesn't matter that God is responsible for them not receiving it. They're still perishing because he has ordained them at this time to be perishing, because they did not receive the love of the truth into their salvation. The concordance says for their salvation, but there's a superscript I-O in front of the word for. I will show it to you here, but my Bible's going to fall apart. I don't know if you can see it there. There's a superscript I-O instead of for. I can't even see what I'm showing you, so I can't even point at it, which means into. So the word is, is literally into. So they do not receive the love of the truth into their salvation. So they're not entering into Aeonian salvation at this time. And therefore, God will be sending them an operation of deception. God will be sending them an operation of deception. See, I never tied this in before with them not receiving the love of the truth from God. So it's almost like, which came first here, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, not receiving the love of the truth or God sending them an operation of deception? I think it's a dual operation. It's, uh, it's contemporaneous. It's simultaneous. They, they don't receive it because God doesn't make room for it because he is sending them, active verb, sending them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood. So no wonder they're not receiving the truth. It's a dual operation, but it's simultaneous. And therefore, because they don't receive the love of the truth, because God didn't give it to them, God will be sending them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood. There's this thing, for them to. He sets the snare, the snare of the cross, the simplicity of the cross, for them to believe that the cross is too good to be true. It has to require my contribution. That 
is a believing of the falsehood based on God sending the operation of deception. The operation of deception, it could be any deception. It could be free will, eternal torment, the Trinity. There we go. Especially free will. That you are responsible for your own salvation. That all may be judged. And here is where the reveal comes. They're all going to be judged. All will be judged who do not believe the truth. See, now God's back to the relative viewpoint. He's tapped into the absolute viewpoint. They don't receive the love of the truth. God's sending them an operation of deception. Okay, that's what's happening above the stage. God's pulling all the strings. But then as we're watching the action on the stage, those people don't believe the truth. That's true. They don't believe the truth. You can look above the stage and find out why they're not believing the truth. God doesn't give it to them. But nevertheless, it's true. They don't believe the truth. But they delight in injustice. That's what I was telling you yesterday. They delight in injustice. They don't realize it, but they, they, they have fun thinking about people burning in hell for eternity. They delight in the fact that Jesus sacrificing for sins on the cross was incomplete and something remains to be done, and it's their cooperation, and that's what gets them saved. They delight in that. They delight in that they believed in Jesus, other people didn't. I mean, it's all unjust. It's all unjust simply by the fact that it's not the truth. It's not justice. I can't say it any better than that. I probably can, and I'll probably think about how to say it better than that after this show, and then I'll probably have to make another show on this tomorrow. And I, I will do that if I see something else that comes out here. But And then verse 13, I'll close with this. Well, this is the capper. I didn't read this yesterday. Now we ought to be thanking God. God always. Yeah. In light of what I told you, of all these snares that are out there and people are frolicking about, not realizing that they're going to spring anytime. They're going to spring. In the meantime, they oh, look at that funny little loop. Look at that funny little loop that looks like uh, grape leaves. Oh, let's play around there. Let's play around. It's like, it's like a jumping rope on the edge of a volcano. Oh, this ought to be fun. It's like nice and warm up here. They don't realize what they're doing. But Jesus said that concerning those who put them on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. These people don't know what they're doing. But it doesn't mean they won't be judged for what they did. It doesn't mean that those people who put Christ on the cross, whether it's the Romans or the Jews, won't be made aware of their terrible crime. And they'll be scrubbed. And then they'll have the realization that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them too. And they actually had a hand in doing it. And they'll get some sort of backhanded backhanded uh notice backhanded not applause but uh oh congratulations thank you for crucifying christ you did a great job but they'll have an understanding of their role as vessels of dishonor and they won't like it but i think they'll learn to accept it and they'll have to give god the glory and once that happens boom boom the life of god comes on them and in the end, God becomes all in all.